A very good morning, everybody, and welcome. On behalf of myself, Adele, and my director, Andy Harmer, and the rest of the CLEAR team, we are delighted that you could join us for this morning's River Cruise discussion. So before we get going, I just have a couple of bits of housekeeping for you. So we'll be recording this session and we will share it on the CLEAR website a little bit later on this month. And even though you'll all be on listen only mode for the duration of the webinar, we'd still like you to contact us. So if you have any comments or questions, please do submit them. And we've made it very easy for you. On the right hand side of this GoTo webinar, there is a little questions uh, icon that you can click on. It opens up a, a slightly bigger text box so you can add in any relevant questions or comments that you have, and we will cover as many as we can at the end of this session. And if your question is not answered, or you can think of something after the webinar has ended, then do drop me an email at afoster at cruising.org. So this morning, we have assembled a fantastic panel of experts for you who will be sharing their knowledge and experiences in the river cruise sector. So today we'll be joined by uh, Jamie Lawazi from AMA Waterways and Chair of Clear River Cruise Committee. Good morning, Jamie. Good morning, Adele. Uh, we also have with us uh, travel journalist, cruise expert and river cruise fan, Sarah Maysfield. Good morning, Sarah. Ooh. Good morning. Good Hello. Morning. There you are. <laughs> um, right and brief. Well, we, we have had some slight technical issues. So um, our other um, travel journalist and, and river cruise expert, Janine Williamson, is unfortunately unable to join us. But we do have the amazing Andy Harmer. Good morning, Andy. I like being called amazing. <laughs> you can you can do this again. <laughs> <laughs> oh, good morning, everybody. Andy, it's over to you, Andy. Thanks very much, Adele. Good morning, uh, everyone. Apologies for the slight late running. As Adele said, we had a few technical issues this morning. Luckily, Sarah and Jamie are with us, uh, if not in person, then at least on camera and to share some of their expertise as well. Um, I should also add that it's a very special week for River Cruise this week because, of course, on Wednesday we have our first ever virtual River Cruise showcase with some great speakers, some great content and some great product updates from some of our River Cruise operators as well. So if you've not yet registered, then please do that through cruising.org. Um, morning, Sarah. Morning, Jamie. It's nice to have people to talk to. How are you both? <laughs> Not too bad. Hoping the sun will come out this morning. <laughs> yeah, I know. Lovely and weekend. Talk yes, it's always good to chalk rivers. Let's start with you, Jamie. Jamie, we know that you have a day job at Ammo Waterways that probably takes up a bit of your time, but you're also heavily involved in a couple of clear groups. Why don't you give us a bit of a taste of what you do? Yeah, so um, alongside my uh, my day job, um, I also um, am involved in the um, uh, the Clear um, Trade Engagement Working Group, which um, is it's a group of people from a cross section of cruise lines, um, whether it be ocean, whether it be expedition, of course, river cruising, um, and we we used to meet in person several times a year. We now meet virtually, um, and our purpose is really to engage. Um, educate and grow the cruise industry via the travel agent community and for us really it's about um, ensuring that the cruise market share against other form of, of travel is is growing so that's why it's it's really collaborative we work with essentially our direct friendly competitors um, to grow the sector for the benefit of everyone within cruising and, uh, and you're also involved in a new global river cruise committee. So tell us a bit about that as well. Um, so myself and some of uh, the executives from our other friendly competitors as well, such as um, Scenic, such as Riviera, such as, as UniWorld, um, we are, are now meeting on a quarterly basis really to um, try and ensure that the sector gets its share of voice um, to implement some new strategies um, and, and really just to grow the profile of River. We see the opportunity for River as huge. I think the, this year has been a, an interesting year, but it does also um, present some, some big opportunities for River. I think River's very well set up for when the demand comes back to really, to really grow. So we're putting in place some initiatives to support our travel agent partners um, uh, to really kind of lay the foundations and sow the seeds for, uh, for what is going to be a very positive 2021. 
very positively said, Jamie. I should just um, ask you quickly about AMA Waterways. How long have you been at AMA and, and what made you move into the river specific sector? So I've been with AMA now for nearly four years. I've, I've worked in, I know, I know. I've, uh, I've worked in cruising for a long time. I was a, a travel agent for uh, nine years. Um, and I always liked the, the luxury ships, the smaller ships. I was very spoiled in my time. I think one of the things that, that really attracted me to river cruising is, is the size of the ships and the personalization of the experience. And it truly is a, a luxury experience. And it's such an innovative sector. And that really drew me in initially. And, and also I'm a real destination nut. I, oh, my lights have gone out now. I'm not moving enough. Um, so there you go. <laughs> For me, Wait, it, occasionally. I will do, I will do. For me, it's always been about the destination. And I think river cruising is such an immersive experience and it really enables you to get under the skin of a destination. So for me, it's it's the perfect way to travel. So that, that was a great draw for me. And Am was very innovative as well, because just quickly, of course, Amma Magna, kind of a new prototype on the rivers as well, which is an amazing ship. Yeah, I think Amma Magna launched um, last year. Uh, it's it, the innovation with with Amma Magna is astonishing. It really is unique. It, it's a double width ship, so it's 22 meters wide. Traditionally, river cruise ships are 11 meters wide due to the size of the locks, but there's a, a stretch of the Danube where um, Amma Magna can operate. She's got um, four restaurants, five bars, a huge wellness space, um, huge deck area, and, and suites of up to 710 square feet. So Actually, she's very well set up to be a stepping stone into river cruising from ocean cruising. So not only has Amma Magna been phenomenal for, for Amma Waterways, but I think it's great for the sector as a whole, um, showing the innovation and also introducing new to river cruise, which is really, you know, that's what we really need with the new capacity that's coming on, not only from ourselves, but also, you know, a lot of people within the river cruise sector. Perfectly said, thank you. Um, I should just uh, reiterate what Adele said. If you do have questions for uh, any of us uh, this morning, then please do ask away. There's a nice question box. And as we come to the end, then we'll ask Adele to see if we've had any questions. I just want to pick up on something you said, Jamie, which was around destination immersion. So Sarah, is that why, is that why river cruising was such a fast growing sector before 2020? I think it's one of the reasons. I mean, obviously, it is, I mean, as you said, Jamie, it's a brilliant way to explore the destinations because it really does sort of concentrate on those areas where the rivers are flowing through. Um, but I think there's a whole number of different factors because you have got this sort of big expansion of destinations now and, and you know, the big expansion of vessels as well. I mean, Amma Magna is one example. You know, virtually all the river cruise lines are adding more vessels. They're all getting more sleek, more facilities. Is, you know, and obviously they are limited because of the size of the rivers and the locks, etc. Um, but I, I think it's an overall thing. But as destination, I mean, my last cruise this year, I managed to squeeze in two cruises before the wretched pandemic struck. And one was the river cruise along the Brahmaputra. But it was a cycling river cruise with a, you know, a small tour operator. Um, and basically we had a fleet of mountain bikes on board and we were cycling about 40 kilometers every day, but we we're going really off the beaten track into these villages where the locals had never seen Western tourists before, certainly not cyclists. I mean, for them, cycling is not a hobby. We would have crowds of people coming out to watch us. And it, yeah, it was amazing. I am a real river cruise fan, I must say. Um, I always, Used to sorry, I used to prefer ocean cruising, but now I'd say on a you path, love them both equally. Oh uh, yeah, <laughs> I, I, it was so fantastic. You know, cycling through paddy fields and the shadow of the Himalayas. Yeah, amazing. And um, destination is so key. Uh, and, and we've talked a lot over the past few years about cycling. I don't know why cycling resonated so much, but I, I, I remember a couple of years ago it suddenly became very exciting to talk about cycling and river cruise. Although you have just resold cycling to me based on that experience in India. But there are other experiences as well that many people won't associate with river cruising on there. Yes, I mean, and also that comes on, I mean, I think it's something we might have been discussing, you know, with the themed cruises, you know, you've got these culinary cruises that are coming up. I mean, I was reading 
you know, one of the lines was it Senic or someone, they're introducing more um, culinary cruises in France, you know, next year, which really lends itself. You've got sort of the Jewish heritage cruises, which I think, Anna, you do, don't you, you know, don't you, Jamie? Um, that there are a lot of sort of, they are getting into more of the specialisms, more of the themes. Of course, one coming up, which is fantastic, which is Christmas markets, um, which I must say is another big favourite really, which I think the river cruise companies do so well because all the boats are decorated so as soon as you get on board you've got the sparkling lights and the Christmas tree and then you're stopping off at the markets along the rivers, um, you know, it's, yes it's fantastic and as I said I think it's all about the companies becoming more imaginative, more innovative and really developing the products that they're offering on board as well as the actual hardware as well, it, it, it's sort of all round. And Jamie, how hard is it for somebody like Emma to differentiate yourself as a as a brand, as an experience to some of the other companies that operate? Well, I think the, the interesting thing, River Cruise is it's probably 10 or so years behind our Ocean Cruise um, uh, partners. And um, I think Ocean Cruising has got kind of a natural pecking order, which has been uh, established. And, and, and there is really good brand differentiation. I think River Cruising still has a little way to go and but I do think that it's to do with a lot of the softer elements that enables um, us to, to differentiate ourselves from from um, uh, from out from our competitors as well you know what what uh, the enhancements that we offer on board in terms of food in terms of wine across all different river cruise lines is is obviously one thing and then how that develops into into theming so wine cruise being a, being a perfect example I think that the types and choice of shore excursions is another thing that that will differentiate um, as well as kind of other things such as the number of staff and crew that you have on board and, and that level of service. But what I would say is, is certainly one of the reasons I feel river cruising has been growing so quickly in recent years is the fact that it offers tremendous value for money, whichever river cruise line you cruise with. And I also think that for a travel agent, the levels of commission that river cruising offers is also very very high so it makes it a very profitable sector for um river cruising uh for, for a travel agent to be in and i think that has also driven um the success of river cruising um because you know uh, uh, traditionally um river cruising it it sold a lot through travel agent partners that you know there, there is a there so that's that's one of the reasons why it's really really grown exponentially in the last few years but but why but from a travel agent perspective, I guess some of the differentiating factors around River Cruise are those soft items as you mentioned, and it's quite difficult to explain them, I guess, or to to kind of educate people on them. So how, how different are the products, and how and therefore how difficult is it from a travel agent perspective? Do you think? Well, I think there's there is a there is a big difference. I think um, you know you what you you get what you pay for in life, and I think that. You know, you at the top end of the, uh, at the top end of the uh, of the market, you've got a great option of choice, and and choice is a is a big thing. Um, whereas um, whereas if you're paying a little bit less, but you'll maybe just have one shore excursion as an example. But at the top top end of the market, you'll maybe have a choice of up to four or five different shore excursions with smaller groups, um, and and that is that's a, a good point of, of differentiation as well. Um, the number of people on the ships also is a is a point of difference. So you know you might have exactly the same ships, and ships tend to be the same size. So you might have maybe up to two hundred people on one ship, and maybe one hundred and forty, hundred and fifty on another ship, and and that gives a a, a more sense of of space. So um, that, that's that's certainly uh, an area where um, you've got a difference between. So it's not just it's not all about um, inclusions and what star rating someone is. There's other kind of softer elements, and and a great way to understand that is to get on board the ships. Yeah. Can I just interject? Yeah, please well? do. Sorry. Um, just to say, actually, that's something for myself as a journalist as well, where I found attending the rear, um, the Clear River Cruise conferences in you know November each year really useful because obviously there were the ships that were all lined up or the or the river boats. Um, and you very much see the differences as you're wandering between the five or six vessels there, how different they are. And for example, you know, it is a lot about the decor as well. So for example, Uniworld is like, I always describe these mini floating Versailles and they've got all the extravagant drapes and the sort of the padded wallpaper and four poster beds even. And it's, it's all very ornate and extravagant. And then at the other extreme, you've sort of got scenic 
which again is is also the same level of luxury, but it's more sort of chic and, and more pared back, um, very cosmopolitan. So you've got two very different styles just there, you know, um, a rosa is different again. So it, I think the best way, as Jamie says, is to see it. But I mean, even just looking at their videos, looking through their brochures, but, but look at the decor, because you've got someone that would absolutely love Uniworld and all that extravagance, but they may not like the sort of pared down Scandinavian feel, perhaps with some of the other lines. So it, it does vary. I mean, yeah. I'm amazed at the differences you can get actually, because they it are all it, yeah. <laughs> a similar size because they have to be the vessels. So it is that onboard character and ambience. And, and yes, yeah, so there is quite a difference between them. So a bit of homework, a bit of attending some clear events. And unfortunately, those in-person events this year uh, are not going to happen. So we're not going to be able to go to Amsterdam this year. But we, that's why we have our virtual showcase this week. So hopefully we can add and uh, demonstrate some flavour of those differences as well. But but Sarah, do you, do you think customers are getting to understand the differences or, or understand the different experiences available? Well... <laughs> I think it's vital, obviously, this is where travel agents come in so much, as you've touched on, um, particularly those that maybe are first time with the cruisers um, or their first time with a particular brand. Because, it, I mean, the, the, the whole story with cruising is the research beforehand, isn't it? Um, yeah. I mean, I... I don't know what the sort. I mean, the loyalty is pretty strong in River Cruises, so I think perhaps people find a line they like, yeah. and they like that style of cruising. They like what's offered, and thus they then they then get sort of pulled into the customer, you know, the customer retention programs as well. So, so, so I, from, I, yeah, no, good no. point. And let me just add a kind of a follow up question to both of you, actually, which is around the customer journey. You, you mentioned that they become a bit brand loyal because they find a brand they like. So. In ocean cruise, we might say a first time cruiser might go to the Mediterranean or might do a short taster cruise. For a river cruise guest, where, where is that journey? Where do they generally start? Should I start with you, Jamie? Yeah, I mean, for a, a, a great kind of jumping off point really would be the Danube. The Danube and the Rhine in particular, they're the two kind of hero rivers. And, and the Danube, you know, you've got this amazing stretch where you've got Bratislava, you've got Budapest, you've got Vienna. So you've got these kind of hero ports of call. Plus, then you've got these beautiful smaller towns and villages that, that kind of make up the, the journey between those between those. So really, the Danube and, and the Rhine are the natural starters for 10, I suppose. And then you've got your other lesser known but equally beautiful rivers, you know, such as the Rhone and then the Douro. So once people get to know a little bit more about the, the, the geography of, of river and they talk to other customers that have may, maybe been on um, other products, and there's then that natural progression. And I kind of feel that that European river cruising sits completely separate from the exotics, like, like um, Sarah alluded to earlier, which is something completely different altogether. But there, there's definitely a natural progression, I would say, with, um, with European river cruising, for sure. Sarah? I would, also, I would also say, I mean, I agree totally got Jamie saying. Um, I would also say that uh, the theme cruises that you're getting, um, which might be good hooks as well to draw in first timers, those would probably predominantly be on on the Rhine and the Danube as well, simply okay. because they offer the most scope. But obviously, you know, you do get the gourmet cruises in France and, and you know, the um, the Rhone and, and the same, you know, I mean, they're, they're coming up in popularity as well. Yeah, absolutely. So if you're if you're starting out in river cruise or you just want to start growing more river cruise sales, then start looking at the Rhine and the Danube. That seems to be what you're both agreeing on. We love it when you both agree. Um, <laughs> we should we should bring it a little bit up to date, I guess, and talk a little bit about this, this year. So river cruising was one of those uh, types of holiday that has started a little bit and it's been a phased return for some of the rivers. Uh, Jamie, any any kind of indication on how that's going? Well, um, some of the European cruise lines are cruising. River cruise lines are cruising. So I know that um, Arosa are cruising, Quasi are cruising. Uh, we've actually got a ship that's been chartered by a German company, so we are cruising, although it's a charter. Um, it's all going very well. Um, I know that um, obviously health and safety protocols have been enhanced. And I mean, let's be honest, you step on aboard a cruise ship and it's always immaculate. The, the levels of, of, of hygiene and cleanliness are always second to none, but they've been elevated even more. 
river cruise lines are, are testing people as they come on, so they're doing temperature checks. They are um, uh, um, spraying down uh, luggage as they come on board, so that's all being wiped down by you know um, alcoholic wipes, etc. There's social distancing on board as well. So on the Rhine and on the Danube, you have a, a maximum number that you can actually cruise with, which is a, as 100 as far as I'm aware. So you've got that social distancing. I also think river cruising generally, you've got social distancing because you've got a, a relatively big floating hotel with not very many people on board. You have small groups um, going ashore. So, you know, it's actually geared up very, very well for the current situation that we're in. Um, buffets have also been uh, have been kind of removed. So it's now a la carte. But again, with a small number of people, I think that river cruising set up very well. And I, and I actually think that um, the situation that we're in has actually fast tracked some innovation that will now become a matter of course going forward. So, you know, in-room dining is another thing as well. You know, we introduced in-room dining for our German charters. So, you know, there's some things that um, people are kind of taking a step back and thinking, actually, is this an enhancement that we want to implement going forward? So, you know, it's, it's, it's being very well received. It's, it's popular. Um, I know, sadly, Janine was on board um, quasi yeah. in France, so um, I know that she would have had some first-hand experience. But certainly what we are seeing is, is very positive feedback. And yes, people have to wear face coverings, but actually it's only normally from point A to point B within a ship. Um, and we hear that actually you're wearing a face covering for, for around about 10 minutes. You know, and we're all used to wearing that now. So, you know, I was in the supermarket the other day and was wearing a face covering for 40 minutes. So that's four yeah. times as long as I would have had to have worn it for a whole day. I was yeah. on board a river cruise ship. So, yeah, uh, Sarah, I, 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 that why that's one of the reasons why Janine was hoping to join us. But I don't know if you have any anything that she said to you, but but um, or whether you've been you haven't been on a river cruise yourself, Sarah. No, sadly not. I was trying to arrange one in Portugal, and that sort of was scuppered somewhat. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. No, from what I know from from a couple of the other journalists who've been, I think they found that you know the face mask issue didn't affect things at all negatively. Things were continuing as normal, and that that it was all still a very enjoyable experience for themselves and and for the other um you know the other passengers as well. So yes, I mean it's interesting what you said, Jamie. Actually, I was just taking a note there about you said some of the innovations that have come about, and you said about in-room dining. And one thing I've noticed, and it's been from yourselves actually, Anna, and also from Uniworld, is um other means of travel to the vessels because at the end of the day, some people will what not still not want to fly. And we'll be worried about sitting on an aircraft with 100, 200, 300 people um, in close proximity for you know an hour or a few hours. Um, and I know that Uniworld has launched self-drive options um, to and from its vessels. And I know, Emma, you've extended no-fly itineraries, haven't you, in, in terms of sort of offering free return rail as well. So I do wonder if that is something we will start to see a little bit more of. And of course, Europe is very accessible in that way. Um, it's wouldn't be so Asia. But... <laughs> it's not far, is it? It's not far down the road of Europe. Um, yeah, so I, think, I, think... I think that's going to be interesting. Yeah, I, I agree with you, Sarah. And I think also, interestingly, I think some of the itineraries will be set up accordingly. So I do think that you know, round trips, as an example, work incredibly well when you're when you're doing a, a self-drive or, or rail. It just makes it that little bit more straightforward. And, and I know that there's some new Amsterdam round trip itineraries that are being launched next year. You know, Riviera have got a new one. Emerald have got a new one. And, and I think that, you know, people will, will there, there are more. It, there's, a, there's more to think about now with with the situation that we're in. But I think that it's about pivoting and looking to the future and and kind of future proofing ourselves against this and and um and making it making it more relevant so um i i think rail is rail is a great one and i think that we need to overcome all the barriers that might be in place in order to make sure that people feel comfortable and confident um coming on board the river cruises because i think from a river cruise perspective i think the ships will do phenomenally well i think the biggest barrier could be getting to and from with people thinking yeah. about you know air travel and rail and and and, the, and what suits them and what makes them feel very comfortable Really good point. I think actually River Cruise has always been, as a, all cruising, has always been innovative and imaginative and kind of pushing them, you know, much further than some of the other hospitality travel sectors. So, so I think that's very true, Jamie. Um, earlier, Sarah, you mentioned Christmas markets, which I guess is kind of the, the, the season that's coming up. For those people who have never Christmas market cruised, Sarah, including me, I've never been on a Christmas no. market. No, I know. Oh. 
one of the uh, best. Uh, uh, what's the, the experience like and how does it differ to a normal summer river cruise? Okay, so, well, okay, I'm thinking back to my first one now, which is only two or three nights and it, and it was on the, um, the Rhine. And, and uh, basically, as soon as we got to the river vessel, they're all beautifully decorated. So, as I said before, as soon as you go in, you've got all the fairy lights. They make a real gingerbread house, which you really have to resist start dipping into, prodding and things like that. But, and, and yes, and they have the Christmas tree and maybe a bit of Christmassy music. It's all very, very festive. And then when you go, for example, my first one was Cologne um, and that has um, three or four Christmas markets in the city but the main one is in front of the cathedral and oh you've got all the stalls which are in like these little alpine sort of little cabins and they're selling I mean I'm a shopper anyway so I just love it browsing you've got all these lovely Christmas decorations and you've got beautiful candles and lovely candle holes it's all the sort of, sort of stuff that anyone that's into all that sort of shopping would love um, and you've got lovely food as well for sale jewelry um, it's ideal for Christmas presents you're finding things that are a little bit different you're finding things that are hopefully made locally and not made in China on the bottom <laughs> but when I looked they were local um, you've got a fabulous um, oh yes drinks glue vine because when I went to Cologne actually because it I would say it does get bitterly cold sometimes on the continent you almost wear need to wear long johns because it, you do feel the cold biting in but I found that after a couple of glasses of glue vine and they sell them in these mugs and you buy the whole thing you buy the mug and it's a Christmas market um, souvenir mug with your with your glue vine and after a couple of those you start thinking oh yeah this is great and just start buying anything but it's it gives you a lovely warm feeling and hot chocolate with marshmallow oh it's just that is the only thing I would say actually when I did the first one we got to Cologne on the Thursday and the market was fabulous it wasn't too busy at all we then cruised to Rudersheim further down the river um, spent a day there when we came back to Cologne on the Saturday it was absolutely packed and yeah. it was a battle getting through and I was so glad that we'd been midweek because then we had been able to explore it. So I sort of almost think weekends maybe to avoid because obviously you've got all the locals then going in as well. But for me, Germany, Germany is tops. And Austria is great, Vienna. Um, and oh, sorry, in Germany, Nuremberg is supposed to be the best. I've not been to it, but certainly Cologne was good. Rudersheim, um, yes, Vienna is lovely. Budapest, nice. Um, Bratis sorry, I'm going on, but I love it. Bratislava, <laughs> beautiful. So, so yeah, the Danube is, is a good Christmas markets one. And, and again, it comes back to the Rhine. But yeah, they are. Oh, they're just wonderful. They're just and wonderful. presumably, if you don't want to wander around the markets, you can still explore the city anyway and explore some of the attractions anyway. You don't have to spend your time in the Christmas market itself. No, I must say I never did. I just did all Christmas markets. But, um, <laughs> but yes, all the attractions are there already. And the nice thing is, is that, for example, I'm thinking of Vienna. You have got that whole Christmas ambiance. You've got the general shops open as well. They had the big wheel by the town hall. And yes, everything is open normally, but you do have that festive feel throughout the city, but you don't have to, yes, you don't have to be in the Christmas markets. You, you can just enjoy the rest of the city. Um, and and uh, there is a fellow journalist who I shall remain nameless, but has spent a lot of Christmas and New Year periods itself on river cruising. So presumably you celebrate Christmas on board the ships as well, Jamie? Yeah, absolutely. So we'll have uh, actually on every single one of our Christmas markets cruises, we will have a Christmas dinner. So you can't Lovely. escape that with all the trimmings. And, and I think yeah, well, New Year celebrations as well for those um, for those ones that go over New Year. And I think interestingly that the atmosphere on board a Christmas markets cruise is very distinctive. It is a bit more, even more relaxed, but it, it, it is very festive on board. And and you know we decorate the ships. We all decorate the ships. And you know we have between ten and twelve pallets of decorations per ship not only the inside but also the outside so it's something that we and, and a lot of the cruise lines take incredibly serious you know a lot of our a lot of cruise lines heritage is european so and the europeans know how to celebrate christmas so you know it's not only the christmas markets that you visit but it's also kind of like the floating christmas market or christmas party that's on the ship that goes from place to place to place and probably has a lot to do with glue vine consumption as well i should imagine that, that helps, that helps. Can, can I just sort of make a point as well, is that I see them quite distinctively different, the Christmas markets cruises compared to the Christmas stroke New Year cruises. So, for example, 
if someone is looking to book and they think, oh, we want to do Christmas markets, but we want to go over Christmas, New Year, in my thinking, it doesn't really work. You do one or the other, because if you're flying out for Christmas, say you're flying out on about the 23rd yeah. of December or something, yeah. A lot of the Christmas markets can finish by then. They might finish on the 20th. I think sometimes they go to the 23rd. So I do know from people who have been out over Christmas, New Year, that sometimes you might get out there. And Christmas Eve and Christmas Day, it's all very quiet because obviously all the locals are celebrating. Sure. The Christmas markets are all shut up and, and all closed. So, But then it's a different Worth thing, checking. isn't it? It's a different celebration. Yeah. But it's just, yeah, don't go thinking if you do a Christmas cruise that there'll be all markets then. Good advice. Good advice. Uh, we're going to come to um, opportunities for 2021 in a second. Just a reminder to everyone, if you have any questions or any comments or any thoughts, for our uh, special guests this morning, then please send them through and we'll be asking Adele to share those questions in a second. So uh, please get them in now. Let's move to 2021 because it'll be here before we know it. Um, Jamie, how, how's 2021 looking? So interestingly, 2021 um, for businesses is, is is good. And I think a lot of river cruise lines are seeing that as well. I mean, let's not be under any illusions. A, a proportion of that is because we've not necessarily cruised this year. So business has been has been shifted. I think there are um, certain uh, trends that, that we and and people within the sector are seeing. So actually, um, suite bookings and balcony bookings are trending higher than they were this time last year. And I think that that is because people have um, maybe uh, they want to have a bit more space, have that fresh air. I think that's kind of a, uh, a reflection of, of, of the situation that we're in. Um, I think that um, longer duration trips, I feel, will be uh, more interesting. And I don't mean maybe moving from seven night to 14 night or, or 10 night, but actually pre and post cruise stays. I think that people will want to explore and I think they'll want to make their next trip count. Um, we're seeing we're certainly seeing that trend and, and certain of my kind of competitors that I'm talking with are also seeing that. Um, and actually the bucket list destinations, uh, the exotic destinations, certain areas anyway, are seeing a lot more traction now than they have done in the past. Certainly we've launched a new Egypt program for next year and the take up on that has been has been phenomenal. And I, I do think that, that that bucket list, whether it be, you know, certain parts of, of Africa, whether it be, you know, whether it be. Um, Maybe a bit more bucket list in Europe, maybe. Certainly, I, I think that, that those destinations are going to be are going to be more popular. Um, and, and there's some interesting developments for 2021. I know kind of TUI are coming into the market in a bigger way in 2021, which I think will be great for everyone. Um, you know, having having a, a, a big boy coming in in that respect is going to be good. And Saga extending um, the success of the Spirit of Adventure into river cruising with their new build, Spirit of the Rhine. I think that's really interesting as well. So. People are investing in the sector, so it, it, it bodes well for 2021. It really does. Good stuff. That's good to hear, given the uncertainty we're in, of course, but that's that's always good to hear. Um, Sarah, anything you're, I'm, I'm just conscious of time, but anything you're particularly excited about for 2021? Um, well, I mean, I think, first of all, I think river cruising, thankfully, is, is helping to lead the recovery because we've already had quite a few lines start up and I'm hopeful that will continue and it will, it will lead the strength of the market. Um, Duro is, is looking, you know, popular people putting vessels in there and, and, um, and Nile, I, I, I mean, I gather is going great guns. And, and yes, I, I do think the sort of the exotic rivers, I mean, I, know, I think the Amazon, that's getting some new vessels or a new vessel, I'm thinking of a line there. Um, and Mekong just seems to be quite an enduring one. Whether, I don't know, I'd be interested to see whether Myanmar comes back at all, because I mean, the rivers there are fantastic and the experiences. And, and as Jamie says, I, I do wonder if people will be doing sort of, you know, more bucket list and so yes the african safaris um the other trend i sort of think it is more fitness uh, fitness fitness sport and fitness um so you created a new whole new theme there by <laughs> what a lovely word <laughs> 
Um, but yes, you know, I did, I did a river cruise with Avalon about this time last year, actually, and all the activities there with the kayaking, a jogging tour that nearly killed me through Vienna, which I've written about extensively. Um, but all those activities, and that really does help you get under the skin of the destination. You know, some of these early morning walking tours before cities have woken up. So I think that also the, the type of excursions are becoming more innovative, of really getting under the skin of destinations. And we, I think we're going to see more of that as well, you know. You, I think you have to share, sorry, Jamie, you have to share, before we go back to Jamie, you have to share that uh, the, the river cruise that you did that involved lots of running. Oh no, that was the thing, the jogging tour. I the only did it to write about it. I'd never jogged in my life. And I was hoping there'd be a whole crowd of people and I could skulk at the back, you see. And there were only two other people taking part. And one jogged, she did marathons. And one was my best friend who I thought was never a jogger. And then she informed me she'd taken up jogging six months before. So I felt completely betrayed and exposed. <laughs> and the two guys leading it, doing marathons all the time. And one said, oh, I only, I only run 70 kilometers a week. And when I'm not training for a marathon, otherwise I do over a hundred. So at that point, I just said, I'm a journalist. I'm just here to write about it. I need to stop to take photos. And the photo stops became my lifesavers because I was on the point of just dropping. Um, but it's five and a half kilometers and I did it, but it was pretty well desperate. Well and my, I went and sat on the boat for the rest of the day. I couldn't move my legs seized up for <laughs> two days. But, but, cycling. Cycling. <laughs> cycling is much easier you've done a lot of cycling i know i wish we had time to talk about it jamie you just wanted to come in before we go to questions yeah no i i completely agree i think that that health and wellness and well-being is is going to be huge but i also think and that's kind of a, a symptomatic of of, of th this year i also think the other thing that we're going to see is the grow growth of, of multi-generational travel and also travel traveling with friends so I think that is going to be a big thing next year. So I don't think it will be just couples traveling. I think it's going to be um, grandparents and, and kids and maybe grown up teenagers traveling together and also friendship groups as well. Because, you know, I think people want to experience life with their friends, with their families. And I, and I think that that is definitely, definitely a trend that we'll see for next year. And so can I just quickly say, and more, more companies are actually, you know, courting the family market, the multi-generational market. I mean, I think with AMA, you've got the interconnecting cabins, haven't you? And then oh, yeah. obviously, um, Arosa are coming out with their new, is it Emotion Ships, which have got these lovely family sort of suites. Um, and then you've got people like Uniworld that do their, um, they do their family focused um, savings as well and talc and whatever. So again, that, yeah, that's something that is really coming up actually. Worth investigating if you're a travel agent has a customer sat in front who wants a good family or multi-generational or group uh, trip. Um, I'm a, I'm also I'm like Sarah. I'm also a big fan of river cruising. Of course, uh, what a great way to see Europe and some amazing places around the world. Uh, Adele, are you there? Do we have any questions this morning? I am here, and uh, congratulations to you three. What a really, really good update on river cruising, and I can tell how passionate you all are um, about the subject. I too, I'm a big river cruise fan as well. Yeah. Uh, we have had a number of questions um, that have come in this morning. So yeah, thank you to everybody that sent in questions. There is still time if you want to send in uh, a few yeah, more. Yeah, please do. Um, our first question is from James Hill, our friend James. Morning, um, James. <laughs> Hello, James. <laughs> <laughs> um, his question is, if ships uh, have to operate at less than 100% capacity uh, when sailings do recommence, will the operators address the huge demand from singles and, and offer more realistic fares by having a greater number of sole occupancy cabins uh, with very little or no supplement? Mm. That's all it, Jamie. Sorry. An interesting question. Yes, Jamie, sorry. We're going to land that with you. No, that's fine. Hi, James. How are you? Uh, Good to hear from you. That's a great question. I think interestingly, in terms of the capacities, uh, we currently know that the capacities are for now. I think once we know where we are for next year, that's when you'll see um, the river cruise lines making those decisions around um, single supplements. I think certain river cruise lines do offer zero single supplements, which is capacity controlled or maybe starting at 25%. Um, but it's a good point. And, and I know certainly that's something that that we're thinking about because obviously if you've got the capacity that's limited you've then got staterooms essentially that are going to go empty potentially and you know we all know that river cruising is a, is a brilliant way for solo guests to travel it's safe you know and, and I think that that safety and security for solo travelers is going to be even more important certainly in the short term um, so uh, I, I absolutely 
think that that will be something if we still have those capacity controls that we will see next year. Yeah, good on, good answer. And actually, yes, you're right. These, the, this is still a changing situation we find ourselves in, but um, but good question. Have, have you, you and I, I've travelled as a single person on a river cruise before, and this is a great way to meet people. Sarah, presumably you've done the same. Yes, yes. I must say, I would it'd always be top of my list for recommending to solo travellers. But even on the larger river boats, you know, in, in terms of the ones that are going on the Danube, the Rhine, I've been on my own as a journalist. But you do, such is the social nature and on the excursions as well. And it's very easy, you know, so many shared experiences. I mean, again, when you go to Asia and, and I think, I don't know, maybe if you're sort of a, a female traveling alone as well, it is that added security of being on board. And when I was sort of on um, the Chindwin River, there were only, it was 11 Americans and myself. Um, so, you know, you're getting this house party where you're literally sitting at two day tables at dinner. And, and it's very, you become a group, you know, like a friendship group. So, which is really nice. As a solo traveler, I'd really recommend it. Thank you, Adele. Fantastic. Uh, we've had a question uh, from Phil Nuttall, and it's a question for Jamie. Uh, recently, Albert Air produced a piece on the Mississippi, uh, which highlighted the tributaries going east, west, and as far north uh, as the Great Lakes. Do you think there's an opportunity in the future for a more barge-like river cruise experience, uh, similar to what Quasi do in France? That was for Jamie. Oh, that's a great, thanks Phil, that's a great question. Um, I'm not sure I necessarily know the answer to that. Um, I know that Quasi have got their um, their paddle ships for, um, for the, for, or their paddle um, engines for, for the Elbe and, and certain areas that get affected by um, uncertain waters. Um, it's difficult, I think that the, the big driver at the moment is, is, is green engines and electric engines and I know that um, uh, a Rosa's new uh, e-motion ship, which I think is it's 2022 now, it's been moved to, has got you know phenomenal um, uh, hardware in terms of its environmental credentials. Um, I know that we've got ships, obviously, that that that, that also tickle those bo boxes. Um, I'm I'm not really sure of the answer to your question, Phil. I'm really not. Maybe Sarah, can I drop you in it and, and ask if you've got any any thoughts? Oh, not really. I must say that's all. <laughs> Oh, you stumped us. <laughs> yeah, well done, Phil. <laughs> so in terms, sorry, I just wanted a bit of clarification in terms of his question. Was it sort of sailing up from the Mississippi up towards the Great Lakes on these when he was saying like a barge like? Because I mean, I know that the Great Lakes is an area that's coming up for cruising yeah. anyway. And you've had some of the sort of more ocean ships going in yeah. there. I think, um, half, you know, half Bag Lloyd or one, weren't they? Or Ponor and some. And the some St. Lawrence the Seaway, yeah. Yes, yes, that's right. But in terms of, was he saying about sailing up from the Mississippi? Yeah, I think so. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, I don't know whether any of the Americans like them. like American cruise lines. I mean, they've just had a new vessel and, you know, whether they're looking to expand because certainly you are seeing more, you know, more companies on the Mississippi now. It's about three of them, I think. Um, and then there are plans for others to start, I think. Um, so it wouldn't surprise me because the way that river cruising is expanding in the destinations, but nothing solid to... To sort we, of add we, shall in, we shall investigate, Phil, and come back to you. Leave it with us. <laughs> yes, yeah, so very interesting topic, actually. Um, yeah. and a massively up and coming area. Um, we've had another question in from Andre Anik, uh, and he uh, says Do river cruisers manage to get more younger people on board? And nowadays, what's the average age? Great question. Sarah, go on. Oh, flip. Um, well, OK, <laughs> certainly younger on the family cruises. So I did one on Uniworld last year and it was full of teenagers. Um, and then, of course, you've had, um, you know, you've had Uniworld with the U by Uniworld, where they were very much trying to attract millennials. OK, they had to make the age range wider and a bit older. Um, but the sorts of activities, I mean, they had drag queen cruises and things like that, didn't they? I mean, I think at the moment, obviously, operation to be put back I think that they bring back one vessel and then another but but certainly you've got that move there and on certain sailings I think you are getting definitely a younger you know a younger demographic um and and there are these sailings that are dedicated to it I mean I don't know Jamie I'd be interested to know what the average age is now um overall for river cruising because it always has tended to be a bit more than ocean cruising generally in my yeah opinion. I think I think the, the 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 reality and the perception is slightly different. So I think it's certainly historically river cruising was for an older age group. It was a bit more 
slow paced and you'd get somewhere and you'd get on the one um, the one tour that there was, which would be a standard city tour. But now people are offering hiking and biking and cuisine tours and and lots of different things. Um, the average age has come down. Certainly from our perspective, we're looking at just just under 60 as an average. So we we're really at 45 plus. And because you've got you know you've got bikes on board, you've got wellness hosts on board, you've got um, river cruise lines with um, you know the the, the A Rose's E Motion ship is going to have um, state rooms for for five people, so a dedicated kids club. So it's bringing that age group down. And I think river cruising is great for for people that want to get out and about and see the destination. So I really do feel that you know if you're looking at people that are 45 plus. I think that they are they are really your kind of your market, your market, those people that want to see a destination, that want to get under the skin of a destination. So the average age is definitely coming down. And actually, sorry, I would just say when I did the Avalon cruise, the sport and active, the active and discovery cruise last year, um, the age was, you know, I'd say, oh, heck. 40s 50s 60s and even the older people they were all fitter than me on the hike they all left me behind because <laughs> i'd never hiked before either <laughs> and i went into the top group rather ambitiously <laughs> and all these older people were just you know steaming on ahead so i would say even when they are older on those sorts of cruises they're very active as well you know very fit but yes that was definitely overall that was definitely a younger a younger we, we need to get you running and hiking <laughs> Sarah. <laughs> it's also the type of person that it attracts it's a mindset thing because you know you get people in their 60s that are more like a, a 50 year old or a 40 year old whereas you might have the same some of the same age that acts very differently so it's more about that mindset and it's that people that want to get out and explore um mm -hmm. you know uh, uh, that that's really the mindset so i think the mindset is becoming younger as well as the age and people yeah. are interested in culture sorry i keep interjecting here i don't want to run over carry time on. No, you carry on Oh, we're, we're running through till midday, by the way, in case anybody's watching. Sorry. No, I just say, also I do find on river cruises, people are very interested in the culture. You know, they're quite highly read, very interested yeah. in the destinations they're featuring, you know, because it's not a beach, you know, flop and drop type thing. It, it, it's, you know, they're interested in the museums and in going to all the, you know, the concerts, looking into the history of the destinations. So you do find that people are very interesting. They've generally done a lot in their lives. And, and as I said, they're very sort of culturally aware. So yes, it's quite a different breed of the cruising. So, so, so not just age, it's also the type of person as well, I think is what yeah. I'm hearing. Uh, yeah. Adele, we probably have time for just one more question. Okay, bear with me. I'm going to try and find a really good one now. There's, there, there have been lots of questions and any questions we haven't got to, um, yes. I can put to uh, to the guests Sorry. here. Um, uh, no, no. Um, and uh, let me have a look. Uh, now, this is a, a, an interesting one from Jane Middleton. Uh, Jane's one of our um, uh, uh, travel agents that join lots of our webinars. So good morning, Jane. Good morning, Jane. Um, and does Jamie have any idea when Amma may be back cruising? That's a very good question. So um, for us, um, we have a good proportion of our guests that are, um, we're very international. So it's not just Brits, it's not just Europeans, but also um, North Americans. There's obviously challenges with um, the North Americans traveling into Europe, particularly the Americans, the Canadians need to quarantine when they get home. So for us, it's really, it, it's a little bit out of our hands. It's dependent upon um, our friends in the EU and, um, in, you know, making, decisions so we are uh we're looking we'd love to we'd love to be able to say we're going to cruise for christmas markets but we really don't know whether that's going to be the case um i think it may be that we'll be looking uh more towards 2021 uh, in all honesty um but if we get the opportunity to travel for christmas markets we will be there with with bells on jingle bells on i would say we love that <laughs> Um, Adele, thank you for the questions. As you say, we'll we'll go back to those people who've asked some good questions, and we'll we'll get our experts here to answer them, except when it comes to the Mississippi, of course. Um, but thank you, for, thank you, Adele, for hosting us so well this morning. Thank you, Jamie. Thank you, Sarah, and thank you everyone who's been watching us. And just a quick reminder: Wednesday morning is our very special uh, virtual river cruise showcase, where you can. Uh, attend some sessions. You can also meet with our sponsors and our suppliers and get some product updates and ask questions and do all kinds of stuff. So that's Wednesday, 9 a.m. through till midday. But from Adele and I and our special guests, 
Uh, have a great Monday and thanks for joining us. Thank, Thank you. you both. Thank you. <laughs>